Good morning, everyone. We are starting with a new hymn today in your small black books, 2117, Spirit of God. Welcome to World Communion Sunday. Do you love your dogs and cats? 
We'll bring them to the church lawn at 4 p.m. on the sun next Sunday, October 9th, for the blessing of the animals. We would love to see them, say a prayer over them, and bless them in the name of the Lord. Treats for the dogs and cookies for the humans. <laughs> so, um, and this Monday we're having um, a meeting for the Methodist women in the fellowship hall at 5.30. And we'd love for all the women of the church to be able to come. We'll have uh, a supper and then we'll have a meeting after that. So we'd love for all the women to be able to come. After worship today, our youth are going to First No Methodist Church McKinney for the bishops' rally. Meet over by the church band. We plan to leave about 12.30 p.m. returning about 6.30. See Debbie Peace for more information. We're so glad you are here today. Please register your attendance online. Share anything you would like to let us know, your prayer concerns or questions that you might have. Just go to fmctown.org and scroll down on the left-hand side. Can you put the dog pictures back on? Can you put the dog pictures on? <laughs> oh, all the hope. So and make sure you bring your dogs to the um, pet blessing on um, this next Sunday so we can get lots of pictures. So we'll have lots of pictures to put on there uh, in the future. Thank you for your financial support for the ministries of First United Methodist Church. There are three ways that you can give. You can place your gifts in the wooden boxes, one at the back and one at the side. Um, you can drop off or mail your check to 503 West College Street, Terrell, Texas. Or you can go online to the website, fmcterrell.org. Um, it's very easy. You just go to that red button and click it. In addition, you may designate offerings to go to the crane relief by placing them in the offering plate that's over here to my left and your right. As we prepare our hearts for worship, hear these words of reflection from Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. <coughs> On the willows, there we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Our next hymn is number 352 in the hymn. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. 352. <laughs> Terry Wynn, who's actually home from rehab now, 
after having a stroke. So be with him. Claire Harper is in not no longer in the hospital, but she is in a, a rehab facility in Rock in a, in 40, recovering. Be with Rick Townsend, who's recovering from a heart procedure this week, and uh, Jill, who's there to take, to take care of him. And of course, be with those in Florida with the uh, terrible hurricane that we've had there, and we just pray for them in the recovery process, which will be lengthy. Also, I just want to share with you that you can make contributions to UNCOR, which is the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and you can, can specifically put in your check that's going for Florida, and they are just hurricane, and they can take care of that. There are other, other prayer concerns that you see there. I want to share with you also, um, Cheryl Thomason texted me this morning, her father, who's uh, Mr. Peters, is 96 years old, and he's in hospice care now at a hospital in uh, Dallas Methodist Hospital after falling and hurting his, his hip uh, badly. So also be with Brenda Rumbo, who's recovering at home from a bacterial infection. No, there are other prayer concerns. Let's just take time and now go to God in an attitude of prayer. Loving Lord, in the quietness of this sanctuary, this place where people have come to turn to you for over 120 years, Lord, in this time we, we share with those saints that have gone before us. And the sense of communing with you, communing with each other, and communing with those around the world who turn to you today. Lord, hear the prayers of these we lifted up. Cheryl Thomas and her, her father, Brenda Rumbo. I'll be with Patrick Carcarino Jr., his healing. Terry Wynn, Claire Harper, Rick Townsend. Dorcas on the loss of her aunt and uncle. Those in eastern Ukraine being forced to choose sides. Harry Bubeck and family as they grieve the passing of his mother, Ina Bubeck. The tragedy of senseless shooting in McGregor, Texas, that took five lives this week just south of Waco, including two children. For all these things, Lord, we turn to you and ask for the balm of Gilead. We ask for healing. We ask for vision and hope for the future. And we ask that you would allow us to see clearly who we are and whose we are. And that each one of us is standing in the need of prayer. And may we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer, together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for our scripture out of 2 Timothy. I'm going to have Derek read that. Second Timothy 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ, 
Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of witness is also in the small books, number 2238, In the Midst of New Dimensions.
little computer issue. All right, I'll do the stretch thing. <laughs> it's so good to see you, Linda. So many so people that are here today. Lots, lots of good folks. Uh, Don, you, you got a grandson there that's like? I do. All right. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right, here we go. Kimmy Gaston. the Center for Leadership Development in the North Texas Annual Conference. I'm here today to talk about Holy Communion in the United Methodist Church. If you've ever served communion, you likely have had a memorable story about that experience. I'll never forget the morning that I was serving communion at the rail. It was our practice at the church to say each person's name as I handed them a piece of bread. Thank goodness, nearly everybody had a name tag. On one Sunday morning, I found myself in a dilemma. The person that I was serving was the Dean of the School of Theology. I had just graduated, and I, he was bigger than life. I knew his name, but I stood over him frozen. Should I call him Dean Kirby or Dr. Kirby, or by his first name, Jim? All I could think was, oh my gosh, what would Jesus do? And it just came out. Jim, the body of Christ broken for you. He looked up and smiled at me with this warm smile, and I began to think about the intimacy that we all experience when we come to the rail and bring Jesus into our lives. It was an intimate gathering where Jesus pulled his disciples together closely to reveal how much he loved them and how much he loved all of humanity. And at the same time, to stand with them and invite them to participate in the Holy Meal. Whether you participate in Holy Communion weekly or once a month, I'm sure you've heard these words. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave things to you, and he broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body in remembrance of me. And then these words, when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So once again, these moments of thanksgiving and remembrance remind us of the intimate connection to Jesus and the living relationship that we have here and now. You may wonder what the pastor is doing at the altar as the words of the great thanksgiving are being read. And the pastor begins to pray over the bread and the cup. We believe that we experience the presence of Jesus as we consecrate the elements. We say, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. The prayer of consecration continues by your spirit. Make us one with Christ, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast as heavenly banquet. Think about these words. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. The consecrated elements are then broken and given to the congregation. We Christians are also called the body of Christ because we believe that we are the body of Christ, redeemed and living out in the world in the faith. We connect to Christ's brokenness and Christ's redemption. This is why we believe in the open table. It is a table of grace, healing, and new life. Therefore, we invite everyone to come and receive this new life through Holy Communion. The open table is one of our distinct beliefs. All are welcome at the table, including children. We believe that God's prevenient love is shared in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup. We also believe that God's justifying love brings forgiveness and insights and sets us on a right path. And lastly, we believe that God's sanctifying love leads us into service to the world. All this happens because God is at work in us, 
no matter what we have or have not done to deserve God's grace. The open table says, Come all ye who love the Lord, who earnestly repent of your sin and seek to live in peace with one another. This invitation is honest, intimate, and real. Holy Communion is one of the means of grace where we come to know God in a meaningful way and we grow deeper and deeper in our devotion and response to God's call on our lives. This means of grace reminds us of our Wesleyan roots, where John Wesley gathered all of the bands of folks, of faithful followers to grow in grace. Wesley invited his followers to take communion as often as they could. As I think about the many faces and names of people who have earnestly come to receive communion, those memories take me back to an eager child's voice who said one communion morning, can I have some more, please? <laughs> I looked at the bread, and I gave him a big old chunk and said, remember that God loves you. His eyes seemed to say back to me, I'm so grateful. I long for all of us to have that same kind of eagerness and gratitude, particularly when we come to the table and connect with Jesus. What if we all said, can I have some more, please? Or even said, with joy and conviction, thanks be to God after being served, then maybe we would be opening our hearts up to be filled with grace, more than we could ever imagine. Next time you have communion, be ready for that grace of Christ to pour all over you, to have an intimate connection with God. Take a moment to be open to God's message for you. And on that day, don't forget to say, thanks be to God. Amen. The anthem today is a Dan Forrest arrangement of the hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. The words are in your hymnals. Number 172, if you'd like to reflect on them as we worship together. 172.
Do you eagerly look forward to Holy Communion? I hope you do. I hope you eagerly look forward to coming to the Lord's table, confessing our sins and being renewed and being refreshed and being receiving from Jesus Christ that new is of life. I love the story that Candy was sharing just now, Candy Gaston, about the, the video of God. I love the idea of, of having us all together here. And she, here she has the dean of the school, the Perkins School of Theology, who she probably had way up here as far as who she thought, this guy is just amazing. He's coming down and she's thinking, how do I call his name? What do I say to, to him? What do I call him? I call him you know, Dean Kirby or Dr. Kirby or Professor Kirby. And finally, she just called him Jim. He's called him by his name. And he smiled, that warm smile. And you see that sense of connectivity that we had this. And it reminds me of uh, the, the connection that Jesus must have had that night with the 12 that were gathered around the table. They were gathered around that table. And you know, you think about that idea. It says in Scripture they were reclining at the table. Reclining at the table. You recline at your dining room table. I mean, those chairs are kind of stiff, right? Kind of, you, know, you don't really recline. Let me tell you about this. So the deal is, if this, this is, we have this picture probably from the, uh, the, the uh, Renaissance painting that you've seen. We think that all of this big, long dining room table, we've got these big, stiff mat chairs. Well, that's not what really was the culture at the time. The culture at the time, what they really did was they reclined. They had a table that was not much higher than the floor, just a little bit off the floor. And they brought the food on them just to kind of keep it off the dusty floor. They've got this low table. Instead of chairs, they sat on pillows. Everybody had their pillow. And you, you ate with, I guess your right hand is eating with your right hand. I guess I would have to learn that. Was the so you're, eating with, you're dipping the bread in there, you're eating, and you're kind of leaning on your left elbow. And you're on this pillow. And you're kind of leaning kind of next to the person next to you. I mean, you're all kind of, there's 12 of you kind of gathered on the table. You're kind of leaning into them. I mean, you're that close. It's a good thing that Jesus washed your feet. You know, you think about that. I mean, they cleaned, cleaned up a little bit, you know, but they're, they're that close together. They're just kind of dipping the bread in and they're eating. They're kind of leaning on that pillow. When he says they inclined, reclined at the table, they reclined to be close to each other. So these people, whether they're high and mighty deans from ivory towers or they're somebody that's down the street and doesn't have a place to live, they're all part of this body of believers coming together as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And we're all growing in our faith. So now I want to not slow this down. I want to bring forward somebody who is part of my, my faith journey. And she's here today. And this is Katie Cannon. You'll say hi to Katie. Wait for Katie. Katie, come on up. Come on up. Won't y'all meet Katie? Won't y'all know who Katie is? Katie, Katie, yeah, come on this way. Katie, Katie is one of my confirmation students from uh, from several years ago. And now she's a college student, almost a grad, almost graduate at UT Arlington and everything. And uh, we're, so, yeah, please go ahead and sit down. I'll sit down too. So we're going to kind of, kind of QA with you and everything. But uh, as, as we come together, uh, this is an example of our Wesleyan roots. The, the idea that, uh, well, that, that Katie's been part of this body of believers, the extended body of believers, for quite some time. And I want to let her share with that. But the first thing I want to say is uh, I saw Katie last time I saw you was in June. We were at an annual conference for the North Texas coming together. And <clears throat> she came when I was ordained as an elder. They came down to the reception. And she was there with a delegation from DeSoto, from the First Methodist Church, because I served there as children and youth director and before I went into uh, going to, uh, to Irving after that, and later on here. And, and as they came down to greet me, and it was neat to be part of that, to have that reception and be with them. And then about three weeks later, she sends me this text, and it's a picture. It's a picture of back when she was in middle school, and she was in my confirmation class, and there's a picture of the confirmants that was there. And she goes, I came across this picture as I was going through some things. Because I, that's the picture right there. Katie, which one are you? Oh, you're in the front there. Yeah, in the, in the, front. In the beautiful dress. Right there. Right. Yeah, and, and there you are. So that's Katie's, and that's me, Kevin Strength, the pastor. And, and so we were doing confirmation, and uh, you know, she said, I came across this picture of confirmation because I'm getting ready to preach for the first time. And she preached that, that Sunday in July, I guess June or July, in, 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 in DeSoto. And so I, I guess the first thing happened, she was kind of, kind of, I guess, kind of nervous about it. But tell me, how did it go? Talk, can you talk, can you turn, tell us how it went preaching for the first time. The sermon went great. The week before was very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go on. 
So I'm not thinking black. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The sermon went well that morning. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I can yell. Hear me out. Hear me out. The sermon that morning went very well. I felt like I had really, you know, preached the gospel, but the week before was absolutely terrifying trying to write that sermon and make sure I didn't say anything that would lead someone astray or give someone the wrong impression about God and his love. But after I got up in the pulpit the Saturday before, I did it over and over and over again. There was no air conditioning, and I just I was standing there sweating and terrified, and I couldn't get myself to stop, and finally... I just got this sense of peace after the last time that I did it, that God had put me here. It wasn't anything that I had done or that the conference had done or my mentor or anything like that, but it was God. And that morning, I expected myself to be completely trembling with fear, and I woke up, and I was ready. And it was, it was intimidating that I was so calm, but after I got up there and looked in the eyes of the people that I was preaching to, it really made all the nerves and all the work worth it. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, these are people that you would know. So that, that brings me to the next question I was going to ask you is, you know, so tell me about your baptism. My baptism, so my mom went to First DeSoto when she was eight years old, and my entire family has been there ever since. Okay. So that's really been, our church family has been my extended family, and my mother and my grandmother, like they were talking about in the scripture, have been very crucial to my faith and my upbringing in the Methodist church. I remember being little, they would always tell me, you know, you have to be nice because everyone's a child of God. No matter who it is, no matter what they've done, they're a child of God, too. And I remember two scenarios particularly. I was a very, very competitive child. I will neither confirm or deny if I still am. But <laughs> I had been playing board games with my grandmother all day long, and she'd let me win and let me win. And finally, she decided she had enough, and she won a round. And I was less than happy. And so finally, she said, well, maybe you should spend some time in the court and go there. And she came out and said, well, are you ready to be nice yet? And I said, no, not really. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, when you're ready to be nice and you're ready to be loving, then you can come out of the corner. Because how we treat others and making sure that we're loving one another was always prioritized in my life. And I remember my mom would sing to me, Jesus loves the little children. And it has the verse in it, red and yellow, black and white. And no matter if I was at home with my mom, if I was in Sunday school, if we were in service, I would always jump in and yell, don't forget about green. Don't forget about green, even the green people. Because that church and my mother and my grandmother had instilled in me from the beginning that everybody's a child of God. And in my brain, that became the equalizer for everyone. That even if people do seem larger than life, if it's the dean of your seminary, if it's a big role model that you have, we're all children of God. And we all need that same love from him and from one another. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so, so really... You were raised up with people of faith. Your family, you're like, like you said about Timothy, you had Lois and, and uh, Eunice, and you had Vicki, your grandmother, and Kimberly, your mom, and, they, and, and then you had all the, the pastors, not just the pastors, but the people of your church. You know, I was just reflecting, because I know a lot of people from the church that I'm serving there that, that probably would have been there at your infant baptism. I guess you're baptized. I, I mean, I imagine Mary and Marcia Scanton were probably there. I imagine you saw, you know, Steve and Jerry and Collins. You probably saw, you know, you know who else would have been there? This uh, Dosha Jones and others would have been there. I mean, people would have been there for you. I, I'm sure the Reeves would have been there. Some of these people's names don't recognize you, but they, they're deep in your heart because I know these are people who poured into you from that moment in your infancy when you're being baptized all the way through in vacation Bible school, in Sunday school, in confirmation class, they were pouring into you still. And uh, and so then, walk me through them, you went through this thing called confirmation. You had this crazy youth pastor that did this. I had a wonderful youth pastor, Pastor B, who did my confirmation. I can only sing praises. And I remember uh, when I started confirmation, it was a little bit before I was sitting in the pew when we were taking communion. And this was the first time I had read I always read through it, but the first time I really felt spiritually what it meant to take communion, and I was listening to how this is a, a chance to start over, a chance to start new with God, no matter what you've been through, who you've, who you've been, is always a new way to start with God. And then I got into confirmation, and it was such an in-depth studying of the scripture and how we can take that into real life and apply that 
to how we act as people in the world. And I know Dosha would sit there with me. I would come early for confirmation, and she would go through the lectures with me and kind of point out different ideas about scripture. And I guess it was towards the end of confirmation, I kind of started feeling a call in the ministry. And then two years after I finished confirmation, I kind of started being vocal about that. And I remember being very intimidated by the idea of going into ordained ministry. But all those people that you just named held my hand and made sure I knew that I was loved, whether I did it or not, but they wanted to make sure that I knew they were there and that they loved me. And, you know, Dosha and you and Kevin went through the confirmation curriculum with me. Uh, Kelsey Bullard, who was a big part of my uh, faith journey, ended up holding my hand through a lot of high school and showing me how to be a good Christian through that. Steve Collins, whenever I officially became staff and started going through budgets, I was completely overwhelmed. And he would sit with me and, okay, this is how you do it. This is exactly where the numbers go. And it wasn't all... Some of it was church work and not work at the church, but they still made sure they were with me and loved me through the entire process. And I think that's a big promise that we make in baptism. That's awesome. That is awesome. So, yeah, I was going to say, so you've gone on to some amazing things. And one of the things I see, I started seeing you shortly after in high school as being a member of the annual conference. You were, they, they had two lay people that could send the annual conference. And they would send, uh, like, Marsha Scanlon, Mary Scanlon, and you. You were not just, you know, this week was tagging on. You were a voting member who was voting on important issues. You were part of uh, actually participating in the life of the North Texas Anglican Conference as a representative of the DeSoto Church. And, uh, and, then, and then to see you doing these things, uh, you serve on some conference things too. I think you've been involved in the conference. I tell Brett's legislation this year. Okay, that's incredible. Just what wonderful work that you're doing. And so that catches us up to now. You're at UT Arlington. You're about to graduate when? In May. May oh, congratulations. Thank What's you. your degree going to be? What's Communications. Communications. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you too. So what are your thoughts, Jan? Are you still processing that? Trying to see where you're going? It's just October 2nd. What are your thoughts, beyond Graduation. After graduation, I definitely want to take some time, get a little stronger in my own faith before I jump into leadership. But I really wanted to work with nonprofits and social justice. Okay, fantastic. That's really good. It's neat to see these things. And so we reflect on these things. And I'm going to have her read something, our conclusion in a moment for the service. But we reflect on these things and we see that this life that starts with baptism is influenced by ongoing communion. When we're brought into the, the, to the communion table, we have a chance to be together and we're refreshed and brought in. I'm not sure if you went to Bridgeport that time. You go to Bridgeport sometimes? Okay, well, Bridgeport. But when, well, I took one time, I took some of the kids to Bridgeport for midwinter. And Michael Bachman was there. He spoke about Holy Communion, what it is. And he put it this way. So you kids listening in the audience, I know you guys listen to pages. He said, rock, he said that Holy Communion is the rocket fuel. That stuck with me, rocket fuel. I mean, think about the rocket fuel that we get. And then, and then we think about what actually took place that night. We think about Christ. And, and he was in that room with those, the upper room with those 12. And they were there together and, you know, you would think it's just this great circle of great love, and they're all sitting around singing, you know, Kumbaya or something like that, you know. But but you really realize there was there was tension in that room. There there was there was tension, and uh, uh, you know, people were not people were were uh, you know really upset at times. There, there was there was the disciples, and then there was this there was this uh, one disciple who they knew was going to betray them. There was also this disciple who was going to deny Jesus. And he was saying that this was before he suffers. He, he longed eagerly to have this time with them. He longed eagerly for that. And so amid the suffering, there was this reclining. They were on those pillows. They were receiving Holy Communion. They were growing in faith. And Jesus, when he talked up the bread, he said, this is my body given for you. And it's changed everything ever since. So we're going to welcome you to the table in a moment. But I want Katie to read something that she has there. I want you to read, uh, yeah, I think it's fan to read this. This is, this is a seminarian who wrote this about what it means to come to the table, this table, and the one to come. On this World Communion Sunday, I am reminded of the words of a seminarian quoted by Christian author Lisa Thompson, who wrote a sermon called, Are You Ready to Come to the Table? 
And then she said, God just told me to tell you that if you are ready for this table, you are ready for that other great table. For John recorded, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. See, this communion feast is just like the rehearsal dinner before the wedding ceremony. I'm getting ready for that great table. I'm getting ready to feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the table where I can rub elbows with Mary and with Martha. The table where all of God's children have a place today. And if that isn't all, I can look down to the head of the table and wave to Jesus. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in that new Jerusalem. I want to be ready to see my Savior face to face. I've got to get ready to come to the table. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. And let's begin. Let's turn to page 12 in your hymnals. <clears throat> Christ the Lord invites to his table. All who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. <coughs> Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us and pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Christ died for us. Okay. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. So repeat that. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And just offer peace to one another. Thank you for, for being here. And then we want to be offering as, as forgiven and reconciled people that us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. The great thanksgiving, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give us thanks to Christ. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. Gave thanks to you. Broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in you with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit, let's get it here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. And when they be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with God, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I want to share with you that we'll have Marcia giving the bread and, and Katie giving the, the juice. We will be proceed, uh, we'll be processing. Uh, first, with the folks from this section coming down this way, the exit out here or this aisle right here. Uh, our usher will guide you through that step. Once we're through with this side of the congregation, we'll move to this side. You all will come in down this aisle and process out that aisle. 
We also have a gluten-free option for those that need that, uh, we would like that. And uh, we also have the offering baskets here as we're collecting offering for World Communion Sunday, for seminary education, uh, particularly those around the world that need seminary education here and there. So, watch you come.
go forth in peace. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the commitment of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is Standing on the Promises. I invite you to stand in the body of Lord Spirit and receive this blessing. If you want to come down and pray about anything or come down and join this church, you're more than welcome to do this. Standing on the promises.